Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, allowing me uh, again to, uh, to talk uh, here about my, my favorite topic, um, our Skalaska tool. And, uh, and thanks everyone who basically uh, was there already last week. So uh, welcome back. Yeah, so today's topic is uh, Mark Andrea already uh, illustrated is uh, again, it's like a second uh, instance of this Core P ecosystem, but this uh, today we are uh, uh, concentrate on tracing with uh, Core P and Skalaska. So uh, again, giving you a big picture, I, I showed you uh, that already uh, last week. Yeah, so this is the ecosystem, how all the different tools work together. So we have Score P. And as you remember, so this is the, the tool who allows to instrument uh, HPC applications, MPI, OpenMP, uh, accelerated, and so on. Um, when you run, and then um, it has a measurement system. So once you run that instrument application, you can either get a profile out in the Cube 4 format, which then, which I showed you also last week, how to uh, like do this profile measurement and then use the cube browser uh, to browse this uh, uh, profile in, uh, information. Yeah, I also uh, already uh, told you that it's a uh, SCOPY measurement system can also configure to uh, produce trace files in the OTF2 format. Um, and the usual way to look at these trace files are these uh, timeline uh, presentation tools. And there's a one called Vampire, which will be presented uh, next week. Uh, and then there's other tools who work on profiles, uh, Tau and Extra P, and, and but they also will be presented by other uh, people in, in, in the future. So today um, I want to focus basically um, so on, on that portion here. Yeah, like what is, uh, so everyone can imagine, yeah, like how profile data looks like and how these uh, uh, timeline views uh, work with MP and other tools, but what is, is this parallel trace analysis in Skalaska, this is kind of uh, specific. Yeah, and so let's concentrate on this uh, thing today. Okay, so uh, this project was born a long time ago, like over 20 years ago, where we realized that uh, in looking at these uh, uh, trace pictures, uh, they, they are, often quite intuitive, but at some point uh, you run into problems. And, and uh, just to give you a hint or something is like, uh, like here is an example of a measurement we did uh, in an MPI class where people are told to write a little MPI program who sends a message around in a ring. Yeah? So uh, process zero sends a message to one, once you received it, it, rece it, it sends a message to two and so on. Uh, until the end, until the last uh, process sends it back to zero. Yeah, and here's uh, a run on 16 processes, um, and you can nicely see, yeah, like here you see the, 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 the messages going through the different ranks and, and sending back. Uh, the processes who are not yet received something, we're waiting and receive. Once they received it, they go into finalize, waiting for the end of a program and are done. So the simple program, you, you can nicely can see it. But now basically look at a more uh, real example. So this is just uh, 64 processes, yeah? And we have much, much larger uh, machines now. And yeah, and so all the black lines here are messages, all the purple constructs here are indications for collective operations. And yes, we see something. So there's here like, like this green uh, procedure. So there's a slight imbalance um, here in front of the second round of sending message, there's more. Yeah, and so the usual thing is do you do is basically you you select that portion, you can zoom in, and then you will find more detailed messages and more and, and so on. And of course, uh, this is working very nicely, but as I said, it has some limitations depending how large your program is. Yeah, 64, 128, 248. Uh, if it's nicely structured. Uh, you will see it and then you easily can spot out uh, the not so nicely structured and, and, and imbalances. But um, so if a, if a program has one or two clear 
problems, like at, at, at one specific portion, uh, you can easily spot the problem. But if it's like little problems uh, uh, all over the program, especially yeah, a lot of these uh, HPC simulation programs are iterative processes. So if you have it in every iteration, but the amount of load imbalance or problem in each iteration is small, so you it, it would you would have to basically scroll through. It, it's, it, it would be harder uh, to see these problems. And then it's not just uh, that you have a timeline view. So typically, uh, like these, these tools, and, and you will learn next week, are very powerful. So you can get additional, uh, like down here, like statistics, is, statistics uh, like the profiles collected out of that, and you can investigate that. So it's not just basically that you have this one picture uh, you can analyze, but you have multiple windows you, you can look at. And then each of the windows you can, with a command line, with a uh, right mouse uh, a context menu, you typically can say, oh yeah, uh, show this, switch to this mode and so on. So you have not just like one picture, but you have hundreds of pictures with, uh, with uh, dozens of menu options. And so uh, a typical user, uh, sorry, um, might get lost uh, quite uh, easily. Yeah, and so what what people typically show you when they, they present these tools is things like this. Yeah, where yeah you zoomed into a specific portion of your program which has a has a, a, a like a clear problem. I say, oh yeah, it's easy to see that here's a problem. Yeah, and and so the idea was basically why let the users like like zoom and scroll through these timelines and looking for these uh, problems uh, cannot do the computer that uh, do that for you yeah and this we call automated or automatic analysis and so uh, yeah like um, especially for MPI but also OpenMP and others uh, uh, as an analyst, you, you you know the typical problems, yeah. And so, like here is one situation that basically all the processes are in this velo routine. Um, at the end, they exchange messages. The, the load was not balanced uh, nicely, so like process seven is done early. So he wants to receive a message and he's waiting and waiting. But the others are still calculating in this this velo until finally uh, zero is done and sends it a message, yeah. And so. Basically, all that portion he is waiting, and he could do something else. Yeah, and we call this uh, uh, situation late sender. Yeah, and the idea is basically, yeah, like, can we write a program who looks for these bottleneck patterns? Yeah, and each of them has a name, has a clear defined uh, uh, structure, and then we, for each of them, we can calculate what is the portion or the amount of time wasted, and then basically what we do is we go through with trace files, and then we tell you we found so and so many problems of 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 that type, and in 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 total you lose so and so much or so and so many seconds of time because of that problem. So the the amount wasted uh, for these different patterns also allows us to rank the different problems. So we can tell you these are the 10 problems we found, how often they occur, where they occur, and how, how, how much impact they have on, on the uh, performance by giving you what is the amount of wasted time for that specific pattern. This is what we basically do. And so this is basically Skalaska explained in, in, in two minutes. But now let, let's give you some details. Yeah, and then hopefully it's much easier. Yeah, and so these are a few uh, other examples. So uh, on the top left is the uh, late sender um, problem I, I just explained to you, but here on the top right, uh, yeah, if you have blocking uh, communication, you can have the other information that you have a send is blocked. Uh, while the receive is too late um, uh, down here on the right, it's like every time you have something like a barrier or a collective operation, which is synchronizing. Yeah, all the processes have to wait for the last one to uh, uh, arrive. And then they, there's multiple places where time is wasted. Yeah, and, and so as I said, we, like, we, we just sit down and you can look at our uh, documentation. We uh, have, I don't know, uh, more than a dozen problems in, in various configurations. And they can get uh, more and more complicated. Yeah, so like, uh, once we identify the late sender, like uh, on the top left, uh, uh, and then look down on the bottom left, is like we we look also was there another message uh, sent to the same receiver from another um, uh, sender, 
but that sender is sent it earlier. Yeah. So basically that the, the last process here on the bottom line, if he would basically said, I, I would have received this message first and then the second one, overall the waiting time uh, would have been uh, shorter. So we call that late sender because of a wrong talk, uh, a wrong order, or it could be a late sender because of you, used, you looked for a wrong tag and so on. And so we can build up more and more complicated patterns to look for. And the more complicated they get, the more they tell you about which, what went wrong and, and helps the user. Yeah? And then as I said, we have things uh, also for um, OpenMP in the same way and so on. So this is basically, uh, it was encapsulated in a, a tool called Scalaska. It stands for Scalable Analysis of Large Scale Applications. Um, and um, yeah, you, you see it already by the name and, I, and, and it's probably clearly seen, but I want to point out exactly. So it has scalable or scale twice in its name. Yeah, so we want to uh, also work, we want to make sure this tool is also working on very large programs and which run on a lot of processes. And our analysis also works on, on very large numbers and, and, and more to that uh, uh, later. Yeah, so um, how does it basically work? And, and partially I showed you that in the first picture and then I explained uh, last uh, time already. So first yeah, we, we take C, C++, Fortran parallel applications and we instrument them and we use uh, score P uh, for that. Um, and then if you just run, uh, uh, run it, you get a, a profile out uh, for every call path. Um, but we make it sure, it, as I said, it, it's scalable. So it, it, it works on uh, a very large number. So our measurement system is able to collect all the information even on very large systems. And also the, the Q browser, which I showed you with uh, topology displays and, and graphic displays and, and distribution displays also allow you to browse uh, uh, profiles which were uh, collected for large programs on very large machines. Or we do what I just uh, tried to uh, explain to you. We do this uh, event trace analysis, basically this looking for these patterns. So basically we, we use Scorpio again to instrument it. We collect event traces. And then on these collected event traces, we, we run our analyzer. Basically this is a pattern search. Yeah, and, and uh, the main thing, um, yeah, like if you have all the information in one place and they can put in, 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 in you have a, a large computer with a lot of memory, looking for these patterns is not too complicated. <coughs> but make it it scalable, this is the, the, the tricky part. And, and what we succeeded is uh, writing this pattern search in a way in parallel that it runs on very large uh, machines. <coughs> and, and by doing it in parallel, as I said, it, it also works on a very large scale, uh, large scale. And we're not just basically looking for this pattern, which is basically this weight state analysis, but we also do, uh, delay and root cause analysis and what I what that means I explain in a minute on critical path and analysis and so on. And at the end, we give you basically the uh, analysis results and then we categorize them saying these are the different problems and by uh, attaching the like these severity, what we call it, like the wasted time for each of these categories. We, we also can rank them and can say, oh, this is a more important uh, uh, problem than, or a, a bigger problem than the others. Okay, um, so this is basically uh, how it looks like. Um, so as I said, you, you run it, uh, you run the trace analysis, uh, you get this enhanced profile out. And, and, and last time I basically showed you, yeah, you have here this hierarchy of a matrix in the left pane of cube where it says, okay, uh, how much is execution time, which splits up in MPI and OpenMP. How in, in MPI, you can distinguish how much is synchronization communication, or you can open up further, say how much is point to point and collective. And, and, and this is where it stopped last time. And now basically we can go deeper and say how much of that point to point is like late senders, late receivers or other problems. So they show up basically in the same way. And it's, it's, it's like the profiling information, but you get additional information deeper and, and you see basically how it connects to the rest of the profile information. So here as an example, uh, this is a measurement on the community earth system uh, model, I think, or module on the sea ice uh, calculation. So this was uh, run on a, on a 
on a blue gene P a while ago. I think it was 16,000 processes. And, uh, and now basically the, the, it, it tells us very quickly that, yeah, so like there's late centers uh, to a specific, quite some amount. Uh, by clicking on it, we see how the, this, the time spending in late centers are distributed. And by again, like as you remember last, uh, last time from Cube, by looking at the color code, the more reddish the value, the higher the value. So like, quickly, you even in large trees, you see here uh, uh, all, the, uh, all the places where it occurs. And this time, it's just like one. It's an MPI wait all call where it's basically waiting for messages and it's inside. A call ice boundary halo uh, update, and this was called uh, here from this step dynamics and so on. Yeah, so we know basically, yeah, like there's uh, there's a lot of waiting um, uh, when these boundary conditions uh, are uh, distributed. Yeah, and and then again clicking on it, I can see it uh, how it's distributed over the. The, the different MPI ranks and so on. Uh, it's it's quite a large number, so I could look at the, the uh, at like a bar plot or distribution plot. So it looks like, but um, I, I told you already we have um, uh, topology topology support, so you can get this graphical representation, uh, which basically shows you a, a diagram. Uh, in one direction, the, the processes in other the threads. But here we have even something better. Uh, if uh, an application is, is using uh, MPI topologies, uh, then we also capture these. And what we see ICE module does is basically, yeah, it, it, it creates this two-dimensional grid, which covers the, the, the earth basically. And then the, the different points on that grid are distributed different processes. Yeah. So, what you see here now on the right basically is is how yeah the selected uh, application the selected metrics and 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 call paths so basically how the late center in this way at all is distributed over the processes which are arranged uh, over the map so we basically see yeah like that like processors on on land basically we do don't do uh, uh, calculations so they, they are white but uh, uh, but we see basically that the, the processes who work on the equator uh, area, where it's basically there's not much ice, they, they have to wait for the others to calculate. And so we can nicely see that, yeah, like uh, that the processes who handle that um, um, uh, basically, uh, yeah, it's very intuitive. Basically, it's clear there's no ice in the equator, so the process is waiting there, and we can nicely see how uh, this tool is working. Of course, not always, uh, uh, not all programs use these MPI, MPI topologies, but even as I showed you last time, if you just see the normal distribution, you see uh, whether, yeah, there's uh, specific ranks or specific uh, threads uh, have issues, and you can nicely uh, compare the. the uh, uh, the analysis result, and 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 by by looking at that, you quickly see, oh yeah, like we we might want to, uh, depending how uh, important you think uh, you want to Im improve that program, how we can avoid these late senders in this Halo update. Um, I, I was talking about finding problems and so on, and and if you listen carefully and and think a little bit ahead. I actually don't show you the problem here. Yeah, what I'm showing you is the the like the waiting, which is kind of symptom. Yeah, but the problem is actually that there's some load imbalance uh, um, before that. Yeah, so if there would be a, a nicely balanced uh, the work, then uh, they all would go to exchange for messages, and there would be no waiting. Yeah, and so in many cases, uh, the, the load imbalance is just in front of the, the message exchange, and then so we easily could find basically which is the region which is unbalanced. But it could happen that the load imbalance was actually quite quite like a, a few phases earlier or a few calls earlier in other routines, and was just kind of distributed. And finally, if I do I I, I do some message exchange, I find it. Yeah, and so. It could be more complicated. So this, once we had uh, at uh, basically implemented this basic pattern search, we uh, implement what we call the root cause analysis, 
Yeah, and basically, yeah, like we have all the information, and once we find like uh, like a late sender or other problem, now we kind of in this forward search where we look for that problem uh, in time. Once we find the problem, we do a backward search again in the same data and seeing oh where could it comes from and where could the the problem come from. Yeah, so like here is this uh, in an example. Yeah, like you have a first a call on every uh, process on foo, then a call to bar, and then you have a exchange. Uh, uh, message exchange and you see actually the calls to bar are uh, uh, the same length so they take the same time but here at the full call which could, was happened earlier there was kind of a load imbalance and, and and this a process took longer so what basically do is that we, we search for that we, we find yeah these uh, uh, late centers yeah like uh, c is waiting for this uh, send and on B, you wait for that send. So this we call the direct wait. Then our analysis finds out that this portion of a waiting is actually an indirect wait because it's waiting for another call which uh, is waiting. Yeah? And then basically we look backward and uh, find, oh yeah, like bar is fine, but there is basically a, uh, an imbalance, we call a delay uh, here in, in foo and uh, in this way, we can tell you, oh, you're like, hey, you know, all this waiting is caused by the delay in foo. And now you can say, okay, in order to fix this situation, I have to improve uh, the, the balancing of the foo or workload. Yeah. Okay, so how does that uh, look in our example I just uh, explained to you? Yeah, so uh, same thing here, uh, CI smart, you will, so, uh, uh, I, here are the delay analysis uh, results. So if I look at the direct waiting time, yeah, it's the same thing here. So we are waiting is this wait all. The, uh, no, that's it, let's see. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the direct waiting time, but if you're waiting directly, you see it's now, oh, we are waiting basically in the Arctic regions. Yeah, so we are waiting for other people to finish calculations in the Arctic region. So the, 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 we, the, Hypothesis is basically we are waiting for the, 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 the processes who are calculating the ice. And then this is where the highest direct waiting time is and the, the, the highest indirect waiting time is basically all the others who are waiting for the, the neighbors who are waiting already. This happens like before in, in the equator area, yeah? which is again, uh, can be explained that. Okay, but now the question is, uh, where does the delays come from? And uh, that was a surprise. So we all thought, oh, the delay comes from the calculation of the, the, uh, of the ice uh, things in, in the Arctic regions. Um, but when we, we did a, a, a a more thorough analysis, especially on a screen where you can zoom in a little bit more or something. So you see actually the high values up, up here around Japan, the Aleuts and something. So it turned out there was a bug in the handling of complicated um, uh, uh, bo uh, island borders, yeah, which uh, caused a problem. And, and this was the original source of a problem, which basically uh, where it cost. And so I said, this is a very uh, uh, lucky example for us, but, but the combination of having a, a, a powerful measurement system, which allows you to, to keep capture traces, even on these complicated and, and large runs. And then an automatic analysis who looks for patterns and delays and root causes and so on and and uh, combined with, with, with uh, a nice uh, topology of you which allows you to connect uh, the performance results to the, to the code uh, you can actually get quite far yeah but even as I said, even in other other cases uh, the analysis part is the same it's just basically where in the uh, program is happening is, is sometimes a little bit more complicated if you have to use just the normal process by thread uh, topology or just uh, distribution uh, displays as i showed you last time okay that was basically the uh, skalaska trace analysis and 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 i will show you basically how that works uh, again later in the demo and then the second portion, which also uh, showed up in this diagram, is uh, I, I said here is remote guidance. Yeah. So what does what do I uh, uh, mean that with remote guidance? Yeah. And basically, what we did is we kind of connected the the 
the browsing of the special uh, parallel trace analysis results in Cube with a Vampire, uh, because at some point you say, okay, uh, here's like here's this late sender, but you want to see basically what happened before and after that occurred in in uh, in the program, and this is of course much easier to see if you have these timeline display where you can investigate the situation where this is occurring. Yeah, and this is basically how we implemented it. So basically, you you start up with uh, analysis, and now basically say, oh, I want to basically do this uh, uh, additional um, uh, uh, analysis connected with Vampire. So first you have to basically make a connection between the two tools. So you use our context menu. And then there's something like connect to trace browser, you connect like we support uh, Vampire and Paraver. So like we say uh, Vampire. And now basically what this means, it basically, uh, uses the operating system to automatically start up uh, the Vampire code on the same um, uh, trace, which was used for the analysis. Yeah. And uh, now basically when I have a problem here, like here is waiting at uh, an n times n operation, um, I can again like uh, use the context menu again and then uh, use this last uh, option here. So max and trace browser. So basically for each of a problem, we uh, remember the, the location in the trace where that problem happened and had the, the most severe uh, uh, impact, like the longest waiting time. And when you select that, it kind of sends a message to uh, Vampire and it zooms in automatically to that place. And then uh, you have that and then you can kind of zoom out or you can use the statistics, things and so on to do further investigate. And, and this way, uh, uh, basically this, you can do this higher level analysis and if the trace is small enough that you can still display it in 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 para uh, in in bump here, you can also uh, do this uh, connection. And in this way, these two tools are nicely integrated. Okay, the last point I, I wanted to make uh, was uh, yeah, like the. I stressed that Scalaska has uh, scalability in his name twice, and and um, yeah. So I want to point out that yeah, like the HPC systems get larger and larger. Yeah. So you you probably know the top five hundred list, which basically collects the the top five hundred most powerful computers in the world. And so I just basically took the data from two thousand. Uh, to uh, last November, every half year the list comes out. And then basically I show you basically here uh, the, the number of cores, um, basically the, uh, like the largest, like the, the system in that list with the largest number of cores, that is the, the light blue line. Yeah, so it's the largest system has now 10 million cores and, and the, the smallest system is, is down here. Yeah, so in the beginning we, we had systems basically with 10 cores uh, when you worked on, on, on HP system 20 years ago and had like 10,000. And now we are up to 10 million, and even the smallest system has like at least a, a thousand uh, cores. And, and this is logarithmic, yeah. So like if you would look up, so it would normally go like Corona-like uh, pandemic. It, it could, goes went up very quickly. Yeah. So if you would say, yeah, I my tool works on the uh, on 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 many important computers. Yeah. So. Uh, perhaps you cannot get access to the really expensive uh, top 10 machines, but even if you say, I want to work on the uh, 450, yeah, like so number 50, uh, 51 is, is this orange line. So basically, if you said every like place 51 to uh, larger, so you would need to handle uh, already 100,000 uh, 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 cores or something, yeah, and the average and median, yeah. So, um, a tool better should be able to analyze between 50 to 100,000 uh, threads and cores uh, in order to do that. Okay, uh, so as I said, we, we, we worked on this quite uh, uh, early. So this is actually from 2010. So this is uh, now uh, over 11 years ago. 
where at ULIC we had a blue chain P system with uh, 300,000 cores, and we could already do an analysis on, on the full system. Um, there's a, a publication about that if you want to read the details, but basically it was a, a Sweep 3D benchmark, and we ran that for 10 minutes. Um, and this basically generated, yeah, as I told you already yeah, last time when you run it on a large number of processors for some time. Yeah, so this generated 7.6 terabyte of uh, trace data, uh, basically in just 10 minutes. Yeah? And, um, and then basically as I said, we, we store that. Uh, in, in a second run, we run our uh, parallel analyzer on the same, number of, of cores, or even our analyzer ran on 300,000 cores, and we made this so you can run it in the same batch job. Yes, you don't have to submit a second batch job with a smaller number, but you can run it in the same batch job, so you don't have to wait extra. And basically, this was reading the, the, the stuff again, and then it took uh, 11 seconds of analysis to find all the patterns in it. Yeah. You might think, oh, there's a lot of reading and writing with this seven and six terabytes, but if you have a machine of that size, yeah, and and uh, this is actually built for this kind of stuff. Yeah, like if you run this astronom astronomical simulations or other weather codes, they generate gigabytes and petabytes uh, in in every run. So these uh, these systems are used to handle that. So just just uh, like writing all the straight like the seven and six tr uh, trace uh, by terabyte of trace data to the file system and then in the second job reading it again um, uh, took like four minutes so it, it's not uh, that much yeah. but it just basically shows you that we were basically running on 100,000 cores already 10 years ago. Um, our uh, biggest experiment we ever did was uh, again with Kalaska. I forgot the time it was probably a few years ago uh, where we still had the Putin Q system, and there we had about uh, half a million, 458 or something cores, but every core was four-way parallel. So if you really ran on, on a thread on every uh, uh, SMT core, you could run to 1.8 million uh, threads, and this is what we did. So we run the neck uh, bench uh, benchmark, it's, it's from the Coral benchmark set. Yeah, and it was as it run on 20 out 28,672 uh, MPI ranks and each MPI had 64 threads. So a total of 1.8 million threads uh, was done and you still can browse it once you get, you get it. And then you we found here that there's uh, like a load balance at this very critical section and where it happens and, and it still works on this case. So you could say, okay, yeah, it was your machine, your tool, you know exactly how to do that. Uh, um, and not a normal person cannot do that, but um, we also have users. So this is actually coming from Itaro Kitayama from Riken from, uh, in Japan. This was on the K computer and he, he worked on a, on a, a uh, a code called uh, NEST, which is a neural network uh, simulator code, which Riken is developing together with Ulic. And uh, he did a measurement uh, uh, and basically he ran on the full K computer again with over 80,000 nodes and with a number of threads. So it was 700,000 threads. And, but this was basically done without our help, uh, just by a normal user. And he was able to use this to analyze this really large scale application. Okay, so that was basically the theory and then uh, basically telling you what we can do and so on. And basically now, uh, like last time, basically giving you some practical information, how to do it. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is basically how I told you how it works last time. So uh, you, you have the application source file, you run it through this instrumenter, you get this instrument executable. When you execute it, you get the summary profile, which you analyze. And, and, and you can basically look at it with Cube. Uh, typically we do some uh, post-processing first, seeing basically uh, is overhead involved and we, we set up the, the, the measurement correctly that uh, we filter out like small functions who just basically create lots of data, but doesn't help us anything and, 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 and reduce it. And this, this uh, setup is very uh, um, important because 
like if you don't filter out all these little functions, when each of them would generate a, a trace record and when basically your trace data would uh, explode. So especially for tracing, you have to make sure you, uh, you have a, a nicely set up uh, measurement set up so that the overhead is not too high. But once you can do that, you run it again, you get the your trace files, uh, as I said, and then you have to run the parallel trace analysis. And, and this generates this enhanced profile. And then again, as I showed to you in, in the slides just before, you can look at all the data like before. Uh, and here is, is like the name again, is that like the, the instrument portion of the measurement portion is done with score P. Uh, the trace files are OTF2 format, the cube files are in the, in the fourth version and cube, cube four. Um, the, there's tools in the browser to look at the data and the trace analysis. This is the Kalaska trace analysis uh, uh, tool. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> again, basically, what uh, in 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 text, basically how to get through these processes. Yeah. So uh, when you do the instrument, basically, I told you you just put this core p command in front of every compile and link command, and then basically this does all the stuff in 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 for you. Yeah. So. What this copy command does, it, it works for compiler instrumentation, uh, uh, make sure the filter specification is handled in the right places. If the uh, program uh, contains OpenMP, it pre-processes all the source file with the source code instrument for uh, OpenMP or PARI. Then he links all the necessary wrapper libraries in the right order and so on. So a lot of stuff is done. And, and in order basically to make it simple, basically this is all captured in in this uh, command score p yeah and um, when we did a profile measurement uh, last time there was no, nothing special you just ran the program it generates the profile and and simple adjustments could be made uh, with environment variables but with tracing it is a little bit uh, uh, more complicated so first you have to set up a necessary envi environment enable the tracing set up the right trace buffers and everything then you have to make sure that all these uh, uh, environment settings is passed to the all processes in threads. Yeah, and, and it depends on your uh, MPI run, S run, Slurm, whatever batch uh, execution, what this means, how to pass these environment variables. When you run the instrumented application, you get the trace files. And then in the same job, you would have to rerun the Scalaska trace analyzer. You have to uh, use the right version because there's different ones for like a plain MPI program or a hybrid one or open MP program on the same job. And so there's multiple things to be done. And in order to make that uh, a simple, we basically also created uh, uh, a helper command we call scan. Yeah, so this is now part of Scalaska. So you you don't get it. So it works together with Scorpy, but you don't get it with if you just uh, install Scorpy. So in order to use that, you have to install Scalaska. And then just by now, uh, like here, you do Scorpy in front of the compile and link command. If here, if you put the scan in front of the uh, MPI exec or Estran or whatever command, it does all that things for you and, and you don't have to think about it. Yeah, and the same thing happens later. Yeah, I said basically you can you can uh, add derived metrics and the hierarchy and so on to this uh, cube file if you know the right command. And when you view it, again, we wrapped that in a command called square. So what square does, it basically it post processes the cube file if it has not been done yet. And then if yes, basically it, it shows up the cube file. Yeah, so basically, if you use uh, not just Scorpi, but Scorpi, Scalaska, and Cube, uh, basically uh, the three steps are just using Scorpi, uh, yeah, Scorpi scan and square commands. And with square commands, they take care of all the, the details and probably the most important things for you. Yeah. Uh, another thing what scan does is it, it sets the environment uh, in a way that the, the, the data which is stored. Uh, has some useful name. So uh, uh, last time I showed you already, Scorpi typically uh, creates a subdirectory with Scorpi and some timestamp. 
Um, uh, but here, basically, what we try to do, uh, do it, if you run it with scan, it uh, generates a, a, a directory, which again starts with copy, but with the name of executable, so you know basically where it comes from, and then basically the, the size of the run, and then sum if it's a profile measurement or trace if it's a trace measurement. Yeah, so like here, it uh, like it would be, this was a copy measurement on the program tea leaf, on two nodes, uh, uh, and it was uh, eight MPI ranks and, and 12 threads or something, yeah? So if you look into these, um, yeah, like when you do just a, a normal copy profile measurement, uh, the results are in this profile.cubex file. If you uh, do the trace uh, measurement and you run the trace analyzer, you get these as I said, the, the outcome of a trace analyzer in, in this scout uh, uh, cube X. And if you do this with square, the post-processing, it generates uh, out of a profile, uh, a, a file called summary and out of a scout, it calls it a trace cube X. Yeah? So if you ever wonder basically what all these uh, files in this directory is are. But if you just use square, um, it, you don't have to think about it, you just say square measurement directory, and it picks basically either trace or summary. Um, uh, yeah, trace it's considered more important. So it picks a trace if possible, if not, it takes a summary. And uh, if none of them is uh, existing, it, it does the necessary post-processing to generate them. Yeah, and as I explained already last time, these post-processed cube files, uh, they include additional derived metrics and that they have this enhanced metrics hierarchy on the left side. Okay, yeah, and basically this is now the same workflow graphically again, just with uh, blue commands. You say here, you put scopy in. If you just measure a profile, you say scan, MPI, exec, and so on. And if you want to do uh, the trace measurement, you say scan dash Q dash T uh, to, pr to, to produce a trace file and do the trace analysis for you. Okay, so uh, like last time, yeah, I, I show you basically how that works on my laptop with this simple Jacobi solver. Uh, here on that URL, you can download that, that code yourself and it includes the C, C++, Fortran versions and the MPI, OpenMP and hybrid. So you can play around in the different modes yourself. And so uh, basically now let's switch to uh, have yeah, a real thing. So uh, yeah, so here actually we are on my laptop. Um, again, we are here in this, uh, I, I pick the, the C version, the hybrid version. And in order to, uh, um, yeah, like last time, let's do the full thing. So normally when, when you compile, oops, sorry, when you compile it, uh, yeah, you have to specify which MPI compiler to use in my case, it's called MPI CC and in C flex, you have to specify the, uh, the command to enable OpenMP, yeah? And now basically it's it's doing that. We uh, I just have a quad core, so I'm just using uh, two threads here, one P num threads, no, num threads equals two. And then I just uh, run it. MPI, sorry, MPI exec dash NP on two. So we run basically on two MPI ranks and each has two threads and I run this Jacobi. Yeah, and so this is the, the normal run. As I said, normally you, you do that, you see uh, how long it's taking. Um, and uh, oh, actually took quite a while this time. Uh, I remember last time it was only four seconds. I don't know why there was a delay. So let's run it again. Where it was, perhaps it was, uh, uh, however it's consistent. But no, it looks like uh, this time it runs, takes eight, yeah, about uh, eight seconds and so on. Okay, yeah, so you, you, as I said, you, 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 you see it and, and, and uh, see basically there is some influence by, a system noise when you have to be more careful. If it's consistent, you remember that time. And then basically now we, we uh, instrument the code. So we do uh, make clean. Yeah, and now we have to make sure we can use the tools and we do that by putting the, uh, put them in the, the tool directories in our uh, 
uh, executable path. Yeah, so either uh, if you do it like here, if I have it just installed directly on my file system, I have to extend the, the path by hand. So we need the scroll P tool. And then we need also the cube tool. Okay, cube, the latest version. And then we also need the Scalaska tool to do that six. Then, yeah, on, on, a, on a cluster, if a sysadmin installed that already for you, there's often modules. So you can just say module load, scroll P, cube, Scalaska, and, and then, it, then uh, it might be simpler. Okay, so now we can rerun uh, the compile command. And as I said, the, every compile and link command, we have to uh, prefix with scroll P. Yeah, and so basically, instead of compiling the different files, it, it now executes scroll P, and each of them basically makes sure that the necessary uh, 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 compile time switches are passed to the compiler because it's hybrid. It would actually run in the background the uh, uh, source code instrument or Opari on it and links everything together, but yeah, you, you don't see it. Yeah? And so now last time I just said, tell you base, just run it. But now what we do is instead of just run it, we put like scan in front of it. Yeah. And so this just does the, the profile. And so now you get a little bit additional output. So it basically says, yeah, this is the uh, uh, runtime summarization of profile experiment. This is where the data will be stored. It gives you a, a timestamp when the starts and when it's done, <clears throat> it basically tells you, yeah, like here, the measurement is complete. Yeah. And so, and it gives you a useful name. And when we look now into this uh, Scorpi uh, file, so we see there's this profile uh, file in it. Yeah. Yeah. And then like last time, you want to score um, um, and, this, uh, and see basically, is there some, some overhead and where would it uh, go to? So you can do this now with a square command with minus S. Uh, does the additional uh, scoring and you just uh, give it the name of a directory. And then yeah, it does the post-processing. So it, it generates like this post-process uh, of uh, yeah, the summary uh, file, but it also runs the score B score command with dash R for, R for you and, and saves it. And now we can look at it uh, like last time. Uh, Oh, is it? Hmm. Sorry. Oh yeah, it's copy score. Yeah, so yeah, I, it says here actually. So, okay, so like head there's twenty five. I just like this way is like this. Uh, cut and paste it so I. Don't, uh, and so we, uh, like I showed you last time, basically it, it tells us basically the, the top regions and, and we can see how much, uh, how often we are called and so on. But like in this simple example, there is no uh, 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 specific problem. So it's nothing we need to filter out or something. And then also the size of the uh, uh, requirements in bytes is not too high. Yeah, And so it actually tells us in order to do a measurement, uh, it needs seven megabytes on every process to do the measurement. Uh, yeah, like a, a typical node has gigabytes, so making a measurement with a few megabytes is, is no uh, big deal. But if it would tell you here, you need whatever, two or three gigabytes, then you know, yeah, like I cannot run the trace experiment because I the, the buffer is, is too large and I would have to do filtering and other uh, things to get this number down into a reasonable way. Yeah, but I... Uh, uh, yeah, please look up that in the uh, advanced training, what we provide or in, in, in our user guide, how to do this. Okay, yeah, and now basically, 
if you want to do a, a, a trace measurement, um, it's it's simple. So we do it with scan again, but uh, we did, as I said, there's dash Q dash T. So dash T enables the tracing, but if you would just say scan dash T, it would do profiling and tracing. So we want to kind of switch off the, the, the profile. This is stuff is done by dash Q. Yeah, dash Q would be quiet, and then dash T uh, does a trace experiment. So like, and then we run that. Basically, you see that. So it's as again, it says now it's a Scalaska trace collection and analysis. Yeah, it it executes the Jacobi as uh, as you see, see here. Yeah, it does the actual. Yeah, it does the actual uh, run. This generates. Uh, uh, traces and then basically does a second run. Yeah, again on on two processes with the same like the same threads. It runs the the Scalaska trace analyzer, which is called Scout, the hybrid version on these traces. And then basically the trace analyzer is running, and and then it generates this uh, additional result. Uh, basically, uh, uh, yeah, and that's basically it. Yeah, so there's nothing too special. The most complicated portion is always uh, in in more complicated programs, especially if we don't know getting this filtering and an original setup right, so that the the trace requirements are are, are not getting uh, too high. Okay, let's go back here to the slides. Yeah, so in the slide, I actually I will show you. So I. I I made screen them, so if you want to redo it by yourself, you can just and follow the, the slides. And and I, I what I said uh, during the demo, I, I also wrote down here in this notes on the side. Okay, uh, looking at this little Jacobi experiment is what well, is not very interesting. So again, I use this uh, tea leaf uh, what I did last time. Um, again, let me start. Yeah, so. Uh, last time I showed you the profile and scorpi, and now we have this uh, 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 scout and trace. So let's look at the, the trace uh, thing, and it basically gives you the yeah. It, it looks exactly like last time. Yeah, so we have here the, the hierarchy as before, um, and then. I can select, say, yeah, where is the computation happening? Uh, and I can follow basically the colors. And I, uh, like, as I explained to last year, yeah, so it was here, the highest colors are in these three kernels here uh, in three directions. And if I can yeah, say, basically, how is this uh, uh, calculation distributed? I can look over the nodes and MPI ranks. Or I can go to topologies and look at, at over the process and thread topology. And typically, you want to do that in the, as I explained last time in the peer distribution, which shows you the, <coughs> the, the biggest range. Because like yeah, when you go down to these numbers on, on every thread, they get small uh, to better see the differences. Uh, it uses the full color scale here. And you see here that there's differences in the different threads and ranks and, and so on. Yeah, and so last time, yeah, basically a profile measurement goes uh, uh, so far. It says basically there's uh, uh, communication uh, point to point and and uh, collective and one sided. And now basically, when we open the point to point and the collective, we see an additional hierarchy. Like here on the point to point, we see these late senders and late receivers. Uh, uh, patterns and here on the collective we see like this, uh, like wait, waiting at an n times n operation. Again, by selecting it, we quickly find it. Say like here, yeah, these uh, forty-five uh, uh, seconds of waiting at an n times n operation happens here inside T all sum, and it's happening basically at this all reduced, yeah, and and uh, yeah. So like last time, you can. Uh, Basically, uh, find uh, basically the places where these problems happening and how bad they are very quickly uh, with the cube tool. Okay, um, that was basically the the demo um, on and an explanation uh, basically how. Scalaska is working and how you 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 practically do it. As last time, here's some pointers to 
uh, to uh, documentation. Yeah, so all, all our advanced training and documentation is ba uh, based on a mesh. Uh, we use as an example with the TMZ benchmark from the NASPAL benchmarks. And uh, I showed you basically that slide already uh, last time, but now I added the Skalaska documentation where in the Skalaska, Skalaska user guide is also like the full set of commands and, and the outcomes documented with the SPT example. Yeah, how to do the, the setting up a measurement, how to do the filtering for these examples and so on. Yeah, and I said Scopy can do much, much, much more. If you are interested in more advanced things, uh, there's a, a pointer to a slide set here, which uh, is basically how to do the manual instrumentation, how to do uh, uh, measurements on uh, with accelerators and so on. Okay, so I have uh, some time left. And so I thought I, I spent the time explaining a little bit if you really want to play around with these tools and how to get these tools on your system. Uh, let me quickly explain basically how uh, to install these tools on a, on a workstation or on a cluster. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this is open source, it is Linux. So uh, installing these uh, typically means it's not like Windows where you, or on Android on your phone or, or your uh, uh, iPhone where you just say, oh, here, yeah, install, click on it, and then something gets installed uh, automatically. So. Here, basically, we, we're using command line tools, uh, shell commands. Uh, we compile the stuff ourselves it's, it's, as it's open source. So you should know basically how to compile uh, uh, commands on, on Linux. And, and of course, you need a, a Linux workstation or a cluster to do it. Yeah? And then you need on that uh, system the necessary compilers installed. Uh, you should have a C, C++ and Fortran compiler. Yeah, at least uh, one set either from GNU, but it could be also Intel, IBM, PGI, whatever. It works with all of them. And you need, uh, uh, if you want to support MPI, you also need an MPI library. But again, it can be Open MPI, MP, Intel, whatever. And if you want to install uh, um, the cube tool, the graphics browser, it, it's using a Qt graphics library. So it should have Qt 4 or 5 installed and, and uh, the devil. Uh, packages of these, and you need to make command. Yeah, so basically, um, here I want to show you, as usual, <laughs> uh, the situation should be not as simple. So there's these different tools, and 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 they have dependencies of each other. So basically, there's three packages you can download: with the the Scorpi, the the Scalaska tool and the cube tool, and and then they have to be the subcomponents. Yeah, like so, uh, Scopy uh, uses the Opari tool for uh, the OpenMP instrumentation. It uses the OTF two library for writing the trace files, and it uses the cube writer and cube lib to do the necessary profile writing files. The cube GUI, of course, uh, needs the, also the cube lib to read the files. It needs Qt. Um, Skalaska and Scopy need MPI. All of them need a compiler. Uh, Skalaska also needs OTF2 to read the trace files and kubewriter and kubelib to, to write the write files. And then we, they belong to each other. Yeah. And so uh, uh, if you really want to basically make an expert uh, explanation, you would have to install these components in the right order, in the right version, in the right thing. Uh, but what I want to show you here is basically the, 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 the next best way is basically yeah, how you can get uh, the whole thing installed in a consistent way uh, without installing too much of these things uh, multiple times. Yeah, and. So basically what you have to do is you have to download uh, three packages. One is the Q package, the score P package, and the Scalaska package. And for each of them is the typical open source Linux way. You have to download it, you unpack uh, the package, you configure it, you compile it and install it. Yeah? And um, if you do it in that order, first installing Cube, 
when Scorpi and when Skalaska, it reuses, yeah, like Scorpi is reusing the, the cube stuff and Skalaska is when reusing the OTF from here and the cube from here. So if you install it in that order, uh, uh, it basically, they are uh, yeah, well synchronized, work together uh, the best way and you, you reuse installations what was already installed. But basically, there's a difference. Basically, if you wanna uh, uh, basically do that for uh, yeah, on a, a cluster for everyone, or on a desktop system, a laptop, they install all three of them. Or um, if you kind of say, okay, I wanna use the measurement and the analysis on the cluster, but then the, the the actual looking at the cube file, I want to, because I don't want to do it over the network, you want to basically uh, do that here. And then basically you would install cube on your laptop just for the, the, the local analysis. And then on the remote cluster, you would uh, install just Scorpi and Skalaska. You would skip the cube portion. The necessary sub packages are actually in Scorpi. Uh, um, so unless there's cube not installed, it basically has enough cube with it uh, uh, to, to can, but it can be installed without the cube one. Yeah. This is just, as I said, explaining how you would do it as a, if, if you're basically providing tools for other people on, on a cluster, you would basically install all three of them uh, in, in, in this uh, order. So how to do the cube one. So here is the uh, website. So it's cube is part of the Skalaska website. Uh, you can download it. The latest version um, is 4.6, uh, uh, but it will basically it will show you always the latest version. And if you download the cube bundle, um, basically, it, basically you get the whole thing in, in one thing. So you basically you download it, then it gets a, a G, uh, it's a gzipped tar file. So you you, once you downloaded it, you unpacket it, and then go into that directory. Then uh, you run the configure command. And in, in a, normally, you only have to provide one option. And the option is basically where you want to install uh, basically the tool, uh, user local, opt local, user packages. I mean, it is probably depends on, on your system where you want to put it. And you typically put it, yeah, basically, you have the the name of the uh, uh, tool and the version in the directory. So you can install multiple versions at the same time. And once basically the configure is through and there's no error message, you just say make. And then if make is everything uh, uh, run through, you just say make install and then everything is copied into this opt local cube directory for use. Yeah. If you have, uh, if you want to basically just use the, the, to the cube tool remotely to analyze, uh, to, to look at the cube files and you have a Windows or Mac uh, OS tool, we actually provide binary uh, pre-compiled uh, versions. So you can just download a Windows version with a Windows installer or a Mac OS package uh, if you want to do that. But on Linux, basically, you would basically uh, get the source uh, code and, 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 and compile it yourself. Of course, you can also install, uh, there's no special requirements. Uh, if you're just a user on a on a another system, and you just uh, you can also just put it in your home directory or whatever or project directory, yeah. So basically, uh, of course, you have to have right access to that directory, uh, so you are able to uh, install it. Or okay, and then Scorpi, basically, it's the same thing. Yeah, you downloaded it from scorpi.org. Uh, it's like it's a uh, it's one large web page, and when you scroll down to the download section, the latest version is 7.1. Um, but again, you unpack it, uh, uh, configure it, make, but in, before you do that, and, and if you have cube installed before that, you make sure that you have the cube tool in your path. Um, because if it's in your path, um, the configure picks up basically the cube installation and doesn't reinstall it, but just uh, reuses the, the cube in, uh, installation, which was already there. Yeah, And then again, you provide the prefix and nothing else has to be done. Uh, it typically looks which MPI is on that system, which compiler is, is typically there. And only if there's multiple compilers in the path and multiple MPIs, then you probably, uh, it tells you basically how to select a specific one and, and, and specify that. So 
Uh, this is an important to know. Um, yeah, so the Scopy uh, tool is compiler and MPI dependent. Yeah, because the different compilers use different uh, OpenMP flags for uh, 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 yeah, and and all has different OpenMP runtimes. Also, the MPI is is is, uh, is source code uh, compatible, but not binary compatible. So, if you want to support on your system, or you have an HPC cluster and you have uh, more than one compiler, say like GNU and Intel, and you have more than one MPI, you have to provide the tools for every compiler and MPI uh, combination. This is un it's. Uh, we can't do something about this. This is uh, how basically this is working. Uh, um, so, uh, but as I said, we can handle all of them and we just basically, you, you, you compile with multiple times. Yeah, so if it's not, as I said, uh, if it doesn't find it automatically, you basically at the configure step, you with, a, with cross compiler suite, you tell basically, oh, use the IBM compilers, the Intel compilers, PGI compilers and so on. If the MPI library again is not auto detected or you have more than one MPI library, again, you say which MPI you have and it typically tells you which options it found and which to select. And if you again have has Poppy on the system for hardware counter measurements and it's not auto detected, or the configure doesn't say found Poppy, um, uh, but you know you have it on your system, you can basically specify where the, the Poppy installation is and it will find it automatically. And then again, there's additional stuff for CUDA, OpenCL, Shmem, and OpenACC. In most cases, it's picked up automatically by, by configure, but if configure tells me it didn't found CUDA support and so on, and you think you should have CUDA on its way, look at the uh, uh, user installation, basically how to uh, enable these in the configure step. And then Scalaska is basically the same thing. You download Scalaska, latest version is 2.5. Uh, make sure the cube and P thing you just installed is in your path. So at the configure, it automatically picks up the P measurements and, and the cube, uh, the, the P uh, modules and the cube modules. And it basically works in the same way. And as uh, uh, P uh, Scalaska is again, yeah, it's a, a compiler and MPI dependent. You need to, again, install it for every compiler and MPI combination. It uses exactly the same flags uh, as, as I just showed you with Scorpy. So this is basically if you would uh, do that uh, by hand, um, it's not too complicated, uh, but I said, if you have multiple clusters and you have multiple MPI, uh, um, compilers and, and MPI things, there's a lot of installation. You have to make sure you don't get lost. You don't forget a step uh, and they, you're very nicely installed. So um, especially as I said, if you taking care of a, a, a system for others, which have multiple compilers and MPI there's where you want to install other tools, libraries, mathematical libraries, installation, and, and you want to easily maintain and update an HPC stack, uh, there's actually tools out there, uh, uh, HPC package managers, and the, the two well-knowns are, you might have heard of SPAC, which is coming from Lawrence Livermore, but there's an older and easily uh, nice tool called EasyBuild, which is from a Belgium um, a university in Ghent. And, and they allow you basically uh, to install and manage uh, these uh, stuff. Well, I, I don't have a detail, uh, uh, the time here to go in details, each of them would easily uh, uh, justify uh, another one and a half hour talk, how to use it. But I just want to point out, uh, uh, if you, yeah, you know, this is your job, you do that more easily. At some point, it's it's worth learning these tools. Of course, they have a, a learning curve uh, to get you started. But once you have that, you never want to go back and, and install all these tools manually. Yeah, and And basically, with easy build, basically you would just uh, say uh, EB, yeah, I want to install EB, uh, Scalaska 2.6 for uh, Intel MPI something, and then basically it downloads and installs it uh, by itself. And, and the same thing is here with spec, say spec install the tool, and when it has a little more cryptical uh, uh, Thing so the, the version is 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 appended with an add sign. The compiler specified the 
percentile and the library is a, uh, the thing and and this and then it goes on and and if it's um, needed other helper tools the, 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 the spec and easy build go off and 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 install the necessary dependencies uh, for you uh, automatically so it, it's worth looking uh, at that okay that is basically what i want to basically tell you uh, this time um and uh hope it was uh, informative yeah uh, to learn a little bit more about scopy and how it could be used tracing with uh, scalaska and i also hope to give you some interesting insights uh, uh basically how to install the tools <laughs>